Hello everyone. So last year War Games Atlantic brought out a box of plastic boxes for the Boxer Rebellion and it sparked a revival in interest in that period of history in the wargaming community and uh, something I've always had an interest in, in, in myself so I thought I would uh, begin a or start a, a Boxer Rebellion project and I already had quite a lot of figures, suitable figures in my lead mountain um, you know that I could uh, without needing to purchase any figures to begin with which I could be getting on with um, so I started, started on these figures here that you can see in front of you uh, Japanese infantry and um, got so far with it and then uh, had a big health crisis at the beginning of January and um, put it all to one side I was just not in the mood to um, undertake any large projects at the time and uh, it was put on the back burner and now I'm recovering I've got back into it so I wanted to do a video on the whole subject of wargaming the Boxer Rebellion um, mainly talking about figure availability but also a few other bits of reading and so on which I'll get to later um, so yeah let's go in. let's get going okay then I'm going to start with this group of 10 figures here and um, much of this video as I say is going to be talking about the various ranges that are available um, the reason I'm showing you these figures first of all is that this is a range that is no longer available um, but I wanted to show them to you first of all to illustrate a point about uh, collecting figures for the, bo the Box of Rebellion um, these figures are from a range uh, called Falcon that I must have bought easily 25 years ago probably more like 30 years ago um, they're so old that, in fact, Falcon um, discontinued their, their work and then another figure manufacturer started up called Falcon as well. Um, they um, produce mainly 15 mil figures and they too, as far as I can see, are no longer around. Um, so it gives you an idea of how old these figures are. The um, reason I wanted to show them to you though are they're, they're perfectly suitable uh, for use in, uh, you know, in, in Box of Rebellion war games but they are intended to be for the Russo-Japanese war and the, this is the first point that I wanted to make about collecting uh, armies for the Box of Rebellion is that there, are, there were a great number of uh, warring nations uh, taking taking part in the Boxer Rebellion and um, a lot of the um, nations that did take place were also fighting um, almost contemporary conflicts around the world so any figures really for the Russo-Japanese war are suitable so you can use both Russian and Japanese figures uh, from from ranges for the Box Rebellion. Um, you've got things like the Boer War, which was going on at the same time, and um, some figures from that would be perfectly suitable for the Box Rebellion. There weren't so many um, regular infantry. Uh, the Royal Welsh Fu Fusiliers um, were stationed in Hong Kong at the time. Um, and they were brought uh, brought down as part of the relief column um, the relief of the siege of Peking that is so you can use some regular figures to represent the Royal Welsh Fusiliers but in the main and this goes not only for the British but for a lot of um, the nations that took part there were a huge number of uh, naval um, infantry that, and artillery indeed as well um, who participated in the uh, in the Boxer Rebellion in, in one way or another um, so any sort of naval troops um, from the Boer War that you, you know you might find in 
other ranges would be ideal as well. Um, another kind of indication to give you an idea of how much the uh, Navy um, was involved in the Boxer Rebellion, um, a lot of the principal naval um, characters of the First World War actually experienced uh, conflict during the during the Boxer Rebellion. So you have not only Jellicoe and Beatty taking part, but also Craddock, who was killed at the Battle of uh, Coronel, I think that was 1914. Um, they all took part in land operations. Uh, Beatty as well um, was actually uh, in the Sudan uh, during uh, Kitchener's camp campaign in the Sudan and uh, was on board one of the Nile gunboats um, that Jellico was was um, almost fatally wounded um, during the Boxer Rebellion was lucky to survive his wounds and go on to his uh, uh, career in the in the Royal Navy um, so anyway yeah um, you're looking really for British figures um, sort of naval naval troops um, but they are they are around and they are available for other conflicts you know contemporary conflicts um, then you've got other conflicts such as America um, was fighting against an insurrection in the Philippines at the time and um, in fact a lot of, uh, I think it was Marines mainly, were brought over from the Philippines to um, um, participate in the kind of allied forces during the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, what else have you got? You've got um, the French colonial um, intervention in Tonkin in 1885, which is, although it's sort of 15 years earlier, um, a lot of the figures from that didn't change, like the French Marines, didn't change their uniform um, in the intervening period. So I'll be showing you some, you know, figures that are intended for the uh, Tonkin conflict, um, which are perfectly suitable for the Box Rebellion, I'm showing those to you later. Uh, there's also colonial troops, there were lots of Sikhs and um, Bengal Lancers um, fought in the Box Rebellion, so you know, draw from colonial ranges. Uh, but, but also, you can get figures that are, you know, dedicated to the Box Rebellion, intended to be for the Box Rebellion. So, let's show you some of those next. Okay, now these figures here are from Old Glory. Um, quite a lot to say about Old Glory. They, um, this range is specifically for the Boxer Rebellion. Um, although, ironically, when I bought them quite a long time ago now, um, I was intending to use them for the Russo-Japanese War. Um, in the end, I decided to war game that conflict in the uh, in 15mm scale, so... Um, I ended up with these in my lead mountain and they're now going to come in handy for the Boxer Rebellion, which is what they're intended for. Um, yeah, Old Glory, as I say, very extensive range. Um, I think they're definitely worth taking a look at. Um, I've just looked up the website there. At the moment, um, Old Glory's UK website has been suspended um, because the owner needs to verify some of his details so hopefully that's just the temporary um, absence and they'll be back trading again on the internet very soon um, they are a little bit uh, idiosyncratic um, the the actual kind of poses of the figures can be can seem a little bit odd I mean they do have this tendency there's a prime example here I can put that figure there and zoom in on him if, if the camera will focus on him alone. Hopefully it's in, in focus. And you can see a lot of them have this um, forward movement. So he's moving that way, um, he's firing that way, but he's looking over his shoulder at something that's obviously distracting him, you know, that's going on behind him. Now, that's fine for one or two figures, but they're nearly all, well, they're not nearly all like that, but they all have a certain kind of degree of head rotation, um, which 
there's another one there which in the end I think becomes a little bit off-putting um, and that's not only the case with these Japanese I'm going to show you some other nations in a moment um, you know it's true of their ranges of you know right across the the board um, but if you can put up with that then I think they compare favorably you know they're quite cheap as I say I couldn't see the price on the um, the UK website but in America they're going you know 30 figures in a bag I actually got 31 as well um, they'd accidentally put an additional figure in the bag um, but 30 figures will cost you $41 in America which is about 33 pounds so you know that's pretty inexpensive I'll talk a little bit more about cost for figures when I come on to the War Games Atlantic figures um, the flags um, I got from uh, Victorious Miniatures and they turned out to be a little bit of a disaster um, you can probably see here where even very kind of I wasn't rough with them at all but even very gentle bending causes creases in them um, but that's not the worst thing about them um, I'm definitely going to replace them um, hopefully you know probably never but uh, I do intend at some some point to try and get get replacements for these flags because I wasn't very happy with them at all but I'll show you I'll just point the camera in a different direction and show you what I mean by showing you some of the uh, flags that I didn't cut out from the uh, the sheet okay so I acquired quite a lot of flags and banners and so on um, from Victorious miniatures, but these flags um, are actually um, they actually originate from Adrian's walls, um, which is a little bit seems a little bit strange until you remember that um, at one point Adrian's walls uh, produced a range of Chinese buildings, which would have been ideal for the the Boxer Rebellion. Um, now Adrian's walls have stopped um, producing the buildings I think they were resin um, can't remember the material they were made from they were really they had really nice buildings um, but they they have stopped um, supplying them now they concentrate mainly on assembling and painting MDF buildings and selling those um, I, I just can't work out what happened with Adrian's Walls. Um, they were certainly very pricey. Um, I was prepared to pay that price, but what I wasn't prepared to put up with and eventually stopped um, purchasing from them was that they were really slow at delivering um, orders and so on and um, weren't reliable at all. Um, but anyway, that's sort of forget about the negatives, um, except that I'm pretty negative about these flags. As I showed you, they damage very easily. They crease and uh, and 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 so on way too easily. Um, but the Japanese flags, in particular, are very very strange because if you actually look at them, um, you can see that the uh, the sun in the middle of the flags isn't circular now I was I was racking my brains to think why that was the case I've never come across a Japanese um, standard where the the rising sun is an oval shape like that um, and I wondered whether it was either because it was intended that you know they they would look more correct once you had crinkled the flag together to look as though it was blowing in the wind or something I don't think that's the case I think it is an error um, and it's not historically accurate I mean I can show you some pictures of banners from the period um, so these are specifically from the beginning of the the 20th century they have the sort of purple border to the flags at that time um, and this these are clearly the flags you know that are meant to be being portrayed and you can see that the sun is circular in the middle of the flag so I just think that is a really 
uh, weird error. Um, the only other reason it might have happened was that possibly they were trying somehow to um, re-shape uh, the flags so that they had accurate proportions and somehow they squeeze them from left to right and it's managed to kind of squeeze the this circle into a kind of oval shape um, whatever way you look at it though it's not very um, satisfactory um, the flags themselves though they do look nice you know it's quite handy to have um, these flags so you've got the Russian sailors flag there the cross of St Andrew um, as I say uh, you know that's quite a nice touch because there were so many naval contingents from you know many of the different nations who took part in the in the Boxer Rebellion so it's nice having that and they do quite a nice range of Boxer and Chinese flags I'll show you some of those while we're on the subject of flags before I go back to showing you figures so this is not sheet number two this is the sort of Chinese Imperial flag there the dragon and then you've got others that are mainly kind of um, ones specifically for the boxers so that you know it's got uh, uh, various like death to the foreigner written on it that kind of thing assist China to exterminate the foreigners uh, yeah anyway enough of those let's get back to showing you figures Okay, this is another group of Old Glory figures. Now these um, didn't come out of my Lead Mountain. I actually, they actually came out of one of my pre-existing armies that I had painted. Um, I originally bought these um, to be part of my Italian colonial army for um, the campaign, the Adawa campaign. Uh, oh dear, that's bad of me, I've forgotten the date. It was either 1894 or 1896. So it's an example of another um, near contemporary conflict that you can draw, um, you know, figures from if you can find ranges for that conflict. The only ones I can think of off the top of my head now are Elite and an Italian company called Strategia uh, Tactica. Um, so again, this is another example of um, where I was drawing on Old Glory's Boxer Rebellion range uh, to use for other other conflicts. Um, but what I've done is um, rebase them now um, so that I can use them in the Boxer Rebellion. Um, and uh, on the subject of the bases, yeah, that's reminded me of another topic for discussion. Um, you might have noticed with my Japanese infantry that I put them on very kind of bland bases without much in the way of um, tufts or anything like that. I've simply given them a bit of a sort of gravelly appearance, um, a dusty look, um, you know, not much in the way of greenery. And there's quite a number of reasons why I've done that. Um, first of all, a lot of the fighting um, took place over kind of in city kind of areas um there wasn't just the siege of uh the legations in peking there were also sieges of uh legation the legations in tianjin um so again more like sort of street kind of fighting um there were cities that were captured by the relief column as they advanced towards um advanced towards Peking, so the old city of Tianjin, um, with the legations in Tianjin were outside of the city area, but the uh, the actual walled city of Tianjin itself was um, fought over. Um, on top of that, it was the height of the summer, very dry conditions. Um, I, I don't really believe there were that many sort of uh, paddy fields um, in that region of China anyway the main crop was millet um, which was another feature of the Russo-Japanese war um, in sort of north to you know from North Korea around into Manchuria um, that the millet crops actually paused um, you know posed a, a significant kind of obstacle in their own right because the millet grew really high 
um, very difficult to get through concealed large bodies of troops when they were in in these millet fields um, and the extreme heat made them very um, you know sort of like ovens as, as the troops were going through them no water lots of heat um, so there were things like drainage ditches and canals and so on um, but I don't think there was much in the way of paddy fields and certainly you wouldn't have got much in the way of um, grass and greenery whether you were fighting in the streets of a city or or out in the countryside um, so that's why I've chosen I thought this kind of basing would um, you know would match much of the terrain that was fought over um, the capture of the Taku forts um, was actually the opposite though um, that uh, the a lot of the advancing troops I think Austrians and Russians in particular um, you know stormed the forts over uh, marshy kind of um, you know areas that were uh, covered by seawater at high tides and so on um, but you you can't produce both you can't represent both on the same base so I, as I say I've gone for this very kind of generic dry earth with possibly bits of rubble or stones on them um, once again I'll, I'll repeat my observation of old glory figures in general I mean there is another classic example of um, uh, a figure running and firing in one direction and then looking over his right shoulder uh, something the other in the other direction and um, you know there are figures that aren't as exaggerated as that but there's certainly a large number of them do seem to have their attention turned um, elsewhere these figures by the way are Bersaglieri um, I'm pretty confident that there weren't any uh, of the regular Italian infantry that took part in the campaign I might be wrong about that but the Bersaglieri definitely did and uh, that's the reason why you don't have any um, standard bearers in this group um, again 30 figures cost you about I'm not sure what the price on the website is because it's down at the moment but $41 on the American site is equivalent about 33 33 pounds okay now another range of figures that uh, definitely are worth considering even though they don't do a, a specific box of rebellion range is war games foundry um, who have a massive uh, collection of ranges of, of figures um, so here you can see some Sikhs that I actually painted up for use in the game of Congo uh, but as I say Sikh troops and uh, Bengal Lancers in particular um, were brought across from India um, and were part of the relief column, the final relief column that reached the uh, uh, legation in Peking, the legations in Peking, in fact I, th I was just hesitating there because I think it was the Sikhs who were actually the first into the compound, the British compound uh, um, you know at the relief of the, the legations, might again might be wrong on that but um, you know, it's just to point out that War Games Foundry is definitely worth considering some of their figures um, for use. Um, and in particular, let's change the camera around again so I can show you some other figures from War Games Foundry that you might want to consider. Okay, now War Games Foundry do a very extensive and very lovely range for the Taiping Rebellion. Um, so at first sort of glance you would imagine that they, those figures wouldn't be suitable because the Taiping Rebellion was actually a very uh, prolonged and bloody insurrection that uh, took place further south in China around the uh, Nanking um, and it took place in the 1850s and mid up to the mid 1860s but the whole point about the Chinese uh, army in particular and Chinese dress in general was that it just didn't change at all for decades um, you know the, the imperial army 
at the time of the Boxer Rebellion kind of still wore what is described as traditional dress. So figures representing, you know, Chinese imperial forces from that, um, you know, for the, for the Boxer Rebellion would work just as well for, you know, the figures from the Taiping Rebellion would work just as well for the Boxer Rebellion. So I made a sort of tentative, you know, purchase of some figures from that range. Um, and I'm certainly going to be getting more. Um, so here you can see uh, some jingles, two jingles which were like very long, uh, almost like blunderbusses, like small, small cannon in a way. Um, that the the Chinese did employ um, during the rebellion as well. Um, so I've got two of those, and then I've got a, another set which is a group of coolies here. Um, again, um, you know, under understated and underrated, but um, very important, particularly in the siege of the legations. Um, they did all the the heavy lifting, literally. Um, during the siege, while the Europeans just manned the barricades and so on. Um, it was the Chinese who were building the barricades, um, countermining the boxers and so on. So you do need to have coolies represented in, in your forces. And here, um, this is just going to be a little um, vignette kind of thing. It's an executioner. Um, so I don't know what I can use it for. Uh, casualty mark or something like that objective marker um, it just appealed to me and it came with it came as a as a group the coolies and the executioner um, so I made that purchase but yeah it definitely take a look at war games foundry even though they don't do a box of rebellion range they do plenty of figures that you could make use of okay here are the figures that uh, set off this current uh, interest in uh, the wargaming community in the Boxer Rebellion. Um, Wargames Atlantic plastic figures. Uh, now they're called they're called boxers. Um, or the box is called a set of boxers. In fact I would argue that um, the majority of the figures that you can make out of these figures uh, are more suitable for the Imperial Chinese Army rather than for the, the boxers themselves. Um, the boxers dress was, um, they were peasants in the main, um, so dressed in peasant clothing, um, which isn't ex exactly this kind of tunic that you can see these two figures here, here wearing. Um, and then they distinguish themselves by wearing ribbons or sashes uh, coloured red um, and there aren't a great many I think there's one there's one kind of figure who's not wearing that sort of tunic so you can see two examples of the same figure here but I think for every one of those there are three of these um, so as I say um, you know, my I, I'm not av I'm not averse to buying plastic figures. Um, you know, I don't discount them entirely. Uh, they're very cheap. They're very useful for bulking out armies. But um, if you want to bulk out your boxer force, you can't actually do that with these figures. That would be my one criticism of them. I'm not criticising the figures themselves, but um, they're of more use for. Um, the Imperial Chinese forces rather than the the boxers. Um, so um, £25 for a box of 30 but they come down in price. The more boxes you buy the cheaper they are. Um, but, but you know th that's not that much cheaper. £25 for 30 figures as opposed to about £33 for the old glory figures for 30 figures. You know it's not a vast saving. Um, my inclination would be to buy their old glory boxes. Um, you can't get the amount of variation out of them, but there are still 30 figures there, you know, that will vary from one figure to another in the old glory set. Um, you know, so I, I, yeah, I don't know. I would, I, I think in, if I were to, you know, start all over again, I might not even bother to buy the War Games Atlantic figures and go and go 
entirely for metal. Um, that's just my thought on it anyway. Uh, okay, let's show you some other ranges. Okay, now this is a very extensive range dedicated to the box, specifically for the Boxer Rebellion. Um, and in this case, you've got a much better um, sample of figures that are actually look like the boxes look rather than uh, in, in sort of a more traditional dress which the, uh, the Imperial forces wore. So uh, you can see here, uh, bare to the waist, another one bare to the waist, these are boxer swordsmen, um, he's wearing a kind of tunic, uh, can't see anything that you could paint red, like a red sash or anything on him, but uh, Nevertheless, you know, far better, far, you know, more historically accurate than the War Games Atlantic figures. And uh, on top of the boxes, I haven't got the entire range here. Just, again, I just brought some, you know, sample figures to get myself going with them. As you can see, I haven't, uh, I haven't started painting any of them yet. You've got Chinese regulars that you can buy with various types of head headgear and so on. So I like the kind of Mandarin uh, hats look. So these are Chinese regulars, brackets, Mandarin. Uh, what else have I got? Lots of, you know, figures that are um, UK Marines, because the, the Marines uh, were actually um, you know the British uh, force in the in the Peking legation. So you need Marines rather than regular British infantry. Uh, these guys will do for uh, you know sort of uh, leaders on the Chinese side, a prince and a general. Uh, I've got various civilian characters, characters like uh, the ambassador's wife. Um, this is clearly uh, a nod to the film 55 Days at Peking. Um, you know, a sort of fictitious character rather than what the ambassador's wife would actually have looked like, especially in the heat of the summer during the siege of the legations. But, um, you know, it's all. Uh, I'll come on to this, you know, whole aspect of. Uh, reality and and Hollywood mixed up and so on a bit later on this this video is going to go on for a long time because I can waffle quite a lot on as you know especially on this subject so I've got some uh, standard bearers for the boxers there and a boxer boxer leader Peking nurse marine officer what else have I got here British Marine Line Infantry, so there's, they're more Marines firing their weapons, um, a Marine officer and a bugler, legation doctor, so he'll be able to go with the, uh, the nurse and uh, play a part in the, in the, in the battle, and so I think we've seen those already haven't you, well they're, they're another yeah, that's the same copy of duplicate of the other pack I just showed you. So definitely Victorious miniatures, well worth a look at. Um, they were the ones I got those flags from as well, but as I say, they had sourced those from Adrian's Walls. And they also sell, um, which they've clearly sourced from Ainsty Castings, various little bits of scenic items. So I got some uh, dragons from them. Um, I think I'm right in saying though that if you went direct to Ainsley Castings, which I should have done, you won't pay as much as they charge on the Victorious Miniatures website. So I think that's a tip for you. Compare prices, and that goes for the flags as well. Compare the prices that uh, you'd be charged by Adrian's Walls for the flags. Um, and I think you'll find it's cheaper to actually go to you know, the primary source. Um, that's the, and again, the same applies for 
MDF buildings, but I'm going to come on to buildings later in this video. While we're on that topic of scenic items though, I'll show you these to you now because it does have a bearing on figure availability. Um, there's a company you may be familiar with called Ashiro, um, whose main output is oriental style buildings, either Japanese or Chinese. Um, they do buildings that are suitable for the Boxer Rebellion. Um, so Chinese, Chinese rural buildings which do have a different look to them to Japanese but these are definitely intended for the Boxer Rebellion. And they also do these um, barricades. Um, f f there are four different types of barricade. Um, clearly uh, you know sort of designed to reproduce the barricades uh, of the siege of the legations in Peking um, they can also be used and they're intended to be used as firing steps as well so you put them up against the wall and then the figures can stand on these uh, boxes and crates and so on barrels um, you know and fire over the wall so they're, they're multi-use either as barricades or firing steps um, but the whole point about the figure availability is that uh, Oshiro do actually have as well a range of Japanese infantry um, now I didn't get any because as you've seen already I've got more than enough Japanese infantry to be going on with but if you're starting off and you want you know particular you know range to choose from then go you know have take a look at Oshiro because their figures are quite nice in their own right um, and you know that the, they're intended for use either in the Boxer Rebellion or the Russo-Japanese War because as I say the uniforms didn't change from you know in that short period of three three to four years um, so the Japanese infantry can be used for either conflict so that's a Shiro okay another range that um, you're no doubt already familiar with or you will certainly come across very quickly if you are searching for figures for the Boxer Rebellion is ironclad miniatures who again do arrange specifically for the Boxer Rebellion and again these figures I would prefer over the War Games Atlantic boxes because they are more sort of properly representative of the uh, style of clothing and the choice of weapons and so on um, that the boxers actually used so again I won't get them all out of the uh, the packets they do do the kind of typical uh, traditional imperial um, army type of figures but they're boxers as I say um, very nice figures and you know, my preference would be for this type of metal figure over the War Games Atlantic plastic. Um, even though you don't have a huge, well, you do, you've got a pretty wide and extensive variety of, of, of figures here. But, um, you know, you have to mix them in with other ranges to get that um, more kind of, you know, spread of different figures. That you might be able to kind of put cobble together from the plastic sack. So that is ironclad miniatures, highly recommended. Right now, here is um, a range that uh, you may not have noticed if you have been searching for suitable figures, and I'm afraid to say that I may have gobbled up all the remaining figures that were available. Um, it's they're from a company called EMP Games, and I got these through War Games Emporium in Sheffield, and um, they didn't seem to have much uh, left on their shelves. Um, so I bought up everything that they did have, and that was back in might even have been last November, definitely December at the latest. So it's been nearly four months. And they haven't restocked 
So I think I got the last of these that were available. Um, I'm very pleased that I did get them. Um, it, so that they're arranged uh, specifically for the Boxer Rebellion and they were initially a Kickstarter um, and it doesn't look like um, EMP games are going to uh, cast anymore um, as I say um, so you, if you want them you'll have to search around on places like eBay if they ever crop up there but um, they're not going to be widely available but they what I like about them is that they are specific uh, troop types um, you know for the for the box of rebellion so there's a lot of naval figures here which you don't see so often so for instance uh, a little group of Japanese sailors here um, now the Japanese uh, figures I showed you before were, were regular army and they certainly did the Japanese and the Russians in particular played a massive part, provided the, the vast bulk of the uh, the figures for um, the, the troops for the, you know, on the Allied side. But there were, as I say, a lot of naval figures involved, uh, particularly they were rushed up from the coast um, to guard the legations in Peking. So you would have had Japanese sailors at the... Uh, during the siege of Peking rather than Japanese regular troops so it's quite nice to get hold of those just such a pity that there's only four and uh, if you want to represent the uh, siege of the legations you're going to need more than that uh, so I've got um, two packets of Italian Bersaglieri and as you've seen already I don't really need any more Bersaglieri but I didn't want to let these go while they were um, you know available so I grabbed grabbed the last opportunity to buy them um, these figures here are French sailors and one of these other two groups are French Marines um, yeah it's these ones here 107 so these are French Marines then the final bag is uh, two, two lots, so two lots in one bag of, uh, these are a German sea battalion I think, yeah so German, kind of German marines I suppose you could call them. Um, but as I say keep an eye out for them but I'm afraid they do seem to have um, you know discontinued the line now um, but I'm gonna I'm certainly gonna keep monitoring the uh, War Games Emporium website in the hope that they do come back uh, Colonel Bills as well does sell EMP games figures but they tend to be other other ranges they, you know they do far more than just the uh, the box of rebellion um, but you might get them in the future from Colonel Bills. Let's go on to another range. Okay, now this is another range that you might not uh, think about, but definitely worth taking a look at and really superb figures. Uh, Gringo Fortis, who do a range which is intended for uh, the French in Tonkin in 1885. But in terms of the uniforms that the Marines and French sailors wore, they are a match for the Boxer Rebellion. Um, so I've got a whole load of these, which are definitely still available. Um, they're quite large, 28 mil. Um, they definitely feel a little bit larger than those uh, previous figures that I was just showing you. But um, yeah just so nice so much character in the figures and uh, you know I bought a sort of sample collection I mean there are things in there that won't be of use like uh, they do uh, French Foreign Legion for that theatre and the Foreign Legion didn't appear in um, 
in China during the Boxer Rebellion. But definitely the Marines and definitely the Sailors are of use. This figure is lovely. Officer figure. He's a separate sword hand, so uh, he, he's not missing a hand. It's just I haven't taken it out of the bag. But yeah, Gringo Fort is, again, well worth a look. And there's another range, again, which um, I, I am fond of and I do buy from, but I don't think they're well known in the UK, so I'll show you those next. Now, there is a company called Castaway Arts uh, in Australia, and I buy from them occasionally. really like their ranges and what they seem to specialise in mainly is sort of 19th century colonial warfare. Um, so I got a lot of my French Foreign Legion figures from them and um, also I was thinking at one point, I still am thinking about it, about it of doing a sort of typical British colonial army that would have fought on the northwest frontier or something like that. So already in my lead mountain, as well as figures, some figures that wouldn't be usable, such as British in kilts and so on, I had some regular British army figures, which, as I say, you know, sort of uh, would have been exactly how the Royal Welsh Fusiliers were dressed. Um, so these are probably going to be painted up and represent the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Um, but I also had from an earlier purchase um, figures for the Bengal Lancers, who again, as I say, did fight in the in China during the Boxer Rebellion. So I got those, and then I recently made another purchase from. Um, Castaway Arts, so I thought I would actually, as I'm off on the Boxer Rebellion now, I would um, get some of their Chinese figures, which again, are um, some of them are specific for the Boxer Rebellion, because they do things like the uh, Tenacious Army and the Kansi Braves and so on. So I think all these figures, these ones look, I don't know. I was going to say they look more like um, sort of peasant dress, but some of them with turbans and so on definitely aren't. Um, but you could, you know, you could make up an army. Obviously, the postage is a little bit of a problematic getting them posted from australia but you could I, I thought as i was buying figures from them anyway i would supplement my purchase with a few um chinese figures and see what they look like and they look pretty good so there's a figure in the sort of typical mandarin kind of cap so it's another range to consider you know if you if you're thinking of uh making a purchase from castaway arts anyway These figures here have got more sort of spear and and uh, pikes and so on, f forked with trident-like weapon. There's a leader there. So yeah, they're, they're definitely going to marry in well with the rest of the figures anyway. Um, so there, they are basically all the ranges that I can think of. I'm sure there are a lot more as well. Apologies for those manufacturers that I've uh, forgotten to include, but as you can see, there is a massive uh, selection of you know figure ranges that you can you can draw on. Um, so now let's go on to uh, a little bit more of a general discussion of the Boxer Rebellion. Right. So, like so many people, um, much of my uh, interest in the Boxer Rebellion was sparked years and years ago by uh, watching this film 55 days at Peking um, it, it's very similar kind of uh, in its effect to the film Zulu in the way so many people saw that you know I saw that when it first came out in the 1960s in the cinema and 
it just inspires that kind of enthusiasm for a particular conflict. Um, but uh, you know, being being uh, the cinema, um, it's far removed from the actual historical reality, and that's true of uh, Fifty Five Days at Peking as well. I mean, the story is highly fictionalized, um, even though it's based on a, a you know a real event. Um, the, you know the uh, the story is the storyline and the characters in it are highly fictionalized and glamorized um you know a classic example is the uh the canal um which is which ran alongside the british legation um and acted as a kind of moat in the uh in the film it's full of water was actually completely dry in the summer months and was pretty disgusting <laughs> as well it was it was really more of a sewer than a canal and as I say uh, dried out almost entirely you know during the actual historic siege but um, it's full of lovely crystal clear water in this in this film it's just an idea of how you know gives you an idea of how the whole um, thing has been sanitized and really that's how you have to approach your wargaming of the Boxer Rebellion um, the siege itself uh, was a pretty horrific uh, experience for the besieged, but um, you know the mass charges of uh, boxers, fanatic Chinese charging at the barricades, um, very kind of uncommon event during the siege. It was more a question of uh, sniping from rooftops and uh, lobbing artillery shells into the compounds. Um, and so on, rather than fighting over over the barricades. There were certainly barricades there, and the majority of the fighting was actually uh, the Japanese fighting through uh, their section. Um, there was quite a lot of hand-to-hand -hand fighting between the Japanese and the boxers, but, um, and, you know, in some other instances, but it was very much a case of uh, the besieged having to, you know, um, survive the uh, cutting off of their supplies and uh, t you know taking their lives in their hands every time they were walking around in the open because they would be picked off by snipers or um, you know be kind of hit as a collateral damage from the the shell fire but anyway so there was that film started it off and then I could remember way way back um, visiting Salute and seeing an absolutely fantastic a uh, game of the siege of uh, of Peking, and I've always I had always wanted to reproduce that, so I thought I could remember that there was an article in Miniature War Games about it, um, so I sort of diligently went through uh, my back copies of Miniature War Games, and I found the article in Miniature War Games uh, number thirty, which was November nineteen eighty five, and. Uh, I was very keen to find this again because um, I can remember it had some pictures but the pic unfortunately the pictures aren't particularly good quality they're all in black and white and uh, they, they do give you a rough idea of what the game look, looked like it was absolutely fantastic absolutely fantastic game so I was hoping I was going to be able to kind of uh, reproduce something like this eventually so there is a very good uh, map of the uh, of the rules and so on and a description of um, how they built the buildings they're all scratch built um, they claim that they're you know historically accurate but I I have my doubts about that now I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment but um, you know, it would. It just looked splendid. It was. It looked fantastic. The game. Um, and most of the figures, interestingly, interestingly, were from a range that um, is advertised here, somewhere. Uh, where are we? Definitely in this magazine somewhere. There is a an advert for. I think they were called Red Wing. Not going to be able to find it in a hurry. Um, Yeah, they were called Red Wing. They don't. They're not around any anyway. So there's no point in um, in uh, 
trying too diligently to to find it but um, at the end of the article as you can see there is a very short bibliography and they mentioned that they use the pictures from one of these books to base some of their scratch built buildings on and um, one of them is Fleming's The Siege of Peking so I did manage to get hold of of that and it does have photographs in here but as you can see um, if I find a picture of a bit of some of the street scenes and so on that's the tacky forts there that one there that's legation street so you can see it's pretty hard to actually get an idea of what all the compounds and legations look like just from um, you know just from these photographs in here so I have my doubts that they they uh, I think they must have used a lot of their own creative uh, imaginations and so on um, when they were building the models um, yeah so there was that one uh, don't think I managed to get hold of the Siege of the Allied Legations, but Osprey's uh, book, The Box of Rebellion, I had already. Um, it's worth getting hold of if you haven't got it. Um, I actually bought this many years ago uh, in order to get an idea of... Um, they didn't do a, a, a book for the uh, Russo-Japanese War at the time, so I got it just to see what the Japanese and Russian uniforms looked like. Um, but now it's going to come in handy for reference work for the, um, you know, for the other Allied contingents. Uh, they were the only two books I actually found from that bibliography. Uh, but I did get hold of this one here, um, which is the Siege in Peking by William A. P. Martin, who was actually present at the siege. Again, few photographs in there to give you an idea of uh, some of the appearances of the buildings and so on. Um, on that subject though, a lot of the uh, first-hand accounts um, you know, that were written at the time, most of the writers do have some kind of axe to grind in one way or another. Um, the, the kind of claustrophobic atmosphere of the of the uh, the siege did lead to a lot of kind of interpersonal um, conflicts and so on and uh, you know antagonisms so a lot of these personal accounts are written very much they're very one-sided and uh, will kind of be a little bit derogatory about some of the other key players and so on um, but nevertheless worth reading um, this book here which is written by a modern historian Diana Preston very good indeed probably the the best you know book written with with no um, uh, contemporary kind of uh, prejudices or anything so you know a more readable account um, that book I showed you earlier the siege at Peking was well written and you know well researched and so on but uh, dates from I think the 1950s so um, you know this is a more The Box of Rebellion by Diana Preston is a more up-to-date and uh, you know uh, studied kind of uh, account very well researched can recommend it it's not just about the siege of the, the legations though of course it's about the the Box of Rebellion in its entirety. A um, couple more Ospreys that are worth getting hold of. Uh, this one here, the Imperial Chinese Armies from 1840 to 1911, will give you a good uh, impression of some of the, uh, uh, the appearance of some of the armies, you know, during the uh, the, the period of the rebellion. Although, you know, obviously it covers a lot of conflicts, such as the wars with Japan, the Sino-Japanese War, and the civil wars, and so on, and the Taiping Rebellion, of course. 
um, but the dress is you know hardly changed at all um, so you can use it as a good uh, reference for the period and this one actually I'm not a great fan of these books uh, they often seem to me to be a little bit uh, cursory and uh, superficial but this book uh, in the Osprey campaign series I thought was very well written and, um, and def definitely well worth a read um, and on top of that it's got some quite nice illustrations in it as well to give you a bit, bit more of a painting guide so that's uh, the attack on the, the original relief column was led by a naval officer called Seymour and it didn't get us it didn't get through um, but the boxes uh, uh, interrupted the, the railway line basically and somewhere in here there's a nice picture of uh, some fighting on the walls of uh, that's that's some fighting at the barricades but there's quite a nice illustration of the fighting on top of the yeah there we are the US Marines fighting on top of, and, and the British Marines trying to clear the uh, Tartar wall uh, so there was some fighting actually up on the wall that overlooked the legations um, so yeah I can recommend that one as well um, also um, again in miniature war games they did have a number there are a number of magazines that had articles on uh, on the Boxer Rebellion in particular there was a four part uh, from issues 65 through to 68 um, that dealt with the Boxer Rebellion a lot of it lifted almost verbatim from Peter Fleming's book that I showed you earlier but nevertheless still worth reading and uh, where is it they do have some kind of pencil drawings of troop types so that, that's so uh, that's the box of rebellion part one it's obviously not in there so let's try part two then see if we can find it No, it's not in part two either. But you see, four four parts together do build up into quite a, you know, comprehensive uh, account of the Boxer Rebellion. This is the uh, them gaming in fifteen millimeter of the attacks on the train. So typical, isn't it? it? Must be the very last article that's got the. Um, there we go. It's got some coloured pencil drawings of uh, various troop types that took took part in the in the battles. So it'll give you a bit more of a, an idea of how to paint your figures. Um, this other one in this is not quite as, as good an article. It was an interesting an article. Uh, I think it's about the Taku forts, but. Um, action in China there we go yeah so it's a it's about the uh, tacky forts but you can see this is typical of the era when is this 1990 but even then they were having to resort to some very uh, uh, um, uh, unsuitable buildings in order to represent a game set in China um, yeah so on that subject of buildings um, as I said that original uh, game that was put on at Salute and taken around the country that uh, you know is one of my fondest memories of uh, wargaming conventions and so on at the time they had to scratch build all these buildings now I would certainly still say that scratch building the Mongol wall is um, is the way to go because it's such a huge part of the table uh, you get an idea there of of its size on the table it's all that stuff across the the end of the table there but of course since the 1980s two things have happened 
One is that we now have MDF, so uh, Victorious Miniatures do do a lot of um, MDF buildings. So here is one, and again, they have sourced these. Oh, where are they from? Where are they from, Ralph? I should have looked this up beforehand. Um, just pause the camera a minute. Yeah, they're actually from war bases. So here, here is an example of one. I, I bought this from um, through Victorious Miniatures, but I could have saved myself a bit of money if I'd gone direct to war bases. And it's the war bases site that actually has the uh, instructions on how to put them together. Um, so it's kind of an you know it's not one of the actual buildings that um, you know would have been present in Peking or Tianjin, but it's sort of typical of a of a building. So you know you can you can make make do with buildings like this. Um, I should have said if I didn't already that a number of the legations still exist in Peking um, it, just to the east of Tiananmen Square is where the legation compound used to be and a lot of the buildings that you know especially the British legation is actually still there um, it's not possible to go around them because most of them are um, official buildings such as police stations and so on um, so you know you take your life in your hands if you even photograph them now but um, if you look on online, you'll see pictures of of the buildings as they were in in 1900 and as they are as they still are today. Um, so that's MDF. Um, I've got another one. I've still this is just a well, um, but that, that there was a well inside the British compound, um, which was crucial to the siege. So. Um, you know definitely be making that up at the moment and then as well as MDF of course we also have 3D printing so I've been purchasing files and printing um, lots of Chinese style buildings um, the only one I've managed to paint up so far is this sort of uh, pavilion type building um, now this looks to me um, just to the north of uh, the British legation compound was a, a, an ancient library called the Hanlin Library which had um, extensive grounds and it had pavilions in it that looked just like this and then on the opposite side of the canal um, to the British legation there was a, 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 a sort of an imperial palace and gardens pleasure gardens um, in which a lot of the refugee Chinese civilians were placed and the, and the Japanese were responsible for defending it and again that I'm sure that would have had pavilions like this in it but of course within a few days of the start of the fighting uh, much of them would be would have been demolished so you would have been looking at rubble anyway rather than a building you know as pristine as this and the Hanlin library itself was deliberately burnt down by the uh, Chinese um, destroying a lot of valuable manuscripts and so on um, but they were hoping that the fire it was so close to the British legation they were hoping that the fire would spread to the British legation and uh, luckily for the British it didn't they managed to uh, douse the flames um, but as, as I say I have been printing up a lot of other bits and pieces are far more than what I'm going to show you but I've just got a selection of them here to show you uh, lots of walls um, because uh, obviously walled streets and walled compounds and so on are going to play a large part in the games so I've got all kinds of different corners and lengths of wall and types of gate and so on and um, some other more kind of uh, simple buildings um, look, looking like that you know which are going to do fine to fill up the war games table and to fight over um, and that is as far as I've got which is not very far as I say I did have this hiatus while uh, I was uh, 
trying to take a bit more care of my physical condition and uh, getting very morose and uh, not feeling that the prospects uh, were you know uh, conducive to any long-term projects but I'm back in the saddle now and going and uh, hopefully be able to bring you some updates on my Boxer Rebellion project as the weeks and months go by. Thanks very much for watching.